Hey, tribe of dream men and women. So, welcome back. This is episode two of living in a martial arts slash spiritual school. <laughs> so, uh, we finished up the previous episode of me going there for the first time for three months. And uh, I came back to Lithuania, got a bit depressed, and my mom said, go back to your purpose. So, let's continue from there. So part of the story which I engaged you in uh, on, on the first part is when I met my Aikido instructor for the first time for like a personal meeting, which we had once a week, more or less. And I told him I wanted to become an Aikido instructor. And he told me that I will have to stay at least for six months, for half a year, and I was planning to stay only for three months, uh, to get a black belt. Uh, also, too, just in case you were freaking out, I did Aikido for like uh, four years before in Lithuania. So it wasn't like, you know, you get a black belt in six months, but also you're training like 15 times per week. So, so you know, it was all of that. And I was freaking out because for a young mind, it seemed forever. I, I thought, I, I was naive, obviously, but I thought I, mean, I trained for four months. So I just go there for three months. I train my, the hell out of myself. And, you know, I'll just like really, really dig everything and, and learn everything. And that's that's kind of how I was. I was always switched on. I was always listening to everything he said, did everything he told me to and, and read all the books. And I was like mad in, in regards to learning. I was sucking everything in. I was a super devoted student. And, uh, and so when he told me that, I need to stay for a few more months. I was like, oh, that's forever. But eventually I kind of, okay, so I like, keep it together, Rokas, you will make it. Funny part is I come back for the second time uh, and I think it was like August. Yeah. And uh, I uh, start kind of feeling the vibe and, and getting started. And initially, interesting also too is the first time I came, I was super confident, overconfident. The second time I came, I was a bit more humble. I, you know, I got that in lo that lost in confusion mode. I burnt myself out. I burnt myself out a little bit by trying to change the world too early. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and uh, I, so I came back a little bit more humble. But then soon enough, I go to a personal meeting with my kid instructor again, and I tell him that you know my plan is the same. Still, I still want to open my own dojo or teach Aikido in my country. I'll stay here, you know, and get the black belt and go. And he looks at me, he's like, well, you know, actually you should stay here for a year, get your black belt, because then the black belt passing was more or less in a year. And he's like, oh, I think it's gonna be good for you to stay for a year, get your black belt, and my brain is exploding. I came back for six months, which seemed a lot for me, and he's telling me to stay for twice longer. So basically I came there the first time for three months, he told me to stay for six months, which is twice longer. I come back for six months, he tells me to stay twice longer, which is a year, and my mind is freaking out. I'm like, holy crap, a year? That's like ages, and I'm gonna get old at that time, and then I'm gonna miss out so many things, and I wanna go back to Lithuania, I wanna you know, open my school, my, my, I, I want to teach Aikido there and, and help people, and so I was freaking out, but I was like, okay, you know what? Okay, I will do this. I, I, I trust him, I believe in him. If, if it's a year, if it's, it's a year. Uh, if we, I continue down that storyline, uh, about eight months pass, my black belt exam is coming closer and, uh, we meet for a meeting again and he tells me, so when you're going to go back to Lithuania after you get your black belt, uh, what, what do you want to, what are you going to work for? What job are you going to work on the side to support your dojo? I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you know, if, if you're going to run an Aikido club, you know, teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you'll initially, you'll still need to kind of support yourself because you're not going to make a lot of money. You'll need to support yourself by doing, by working something else on the side. And uh, it makes sense. I think it was a smart suggestion from him. And so he asked me, so what are you going to work on the side? And I was like, uh, there's nothing I really want to work on. <laughs> work as and he started giving me options he's like well maybe you want to be a waiter at least or you know anything else like what inspires you and I kept thinking and thinking I was like nothing inspires me I'm like I want to be a full-on professional like you know instructor there's nothing else I want to do 
I'm full in on this. I don't want to do anything else on the side. And he listened to me and he's like, well, okay, well, I can, I can dig that. And he's, and he tells me, so that means probably then that means you should stay another year. Then you will get your second degree black belt. Um, you will, and, and then he told me then, then you should maybe also consider becoming a yoga instructor because if you run a full school, you know, that kind of differentiates the classes and you have different people in different classes. So it's going to be easier to support yourself again in that way. And, and maybe you should also, by the end of it, go to a India for a month or two to kind of settle in and get more life experience before you start. And I think it's a great, again, it was a great advice, great suggestion. But again, looking back, my mind is freaking out, you know, because I'm like, crap, that's again, double. That's again, double from what I was planning to do. And it's one more year. That's forever. And then I stopped. I caught myself doing that. And I actually remember that moment very vividly, which is, which is pretty, pretty interesting. And I caught myself. I was like, I've been here before. I've been here before. This is not the way to go. And, and I, I caught myself and I said, you know what, Orcas? Let's do this. Don't think about when you will leave. Just focus on being there. Become so good. You know, like, like learn everything possible. Become so good that people would look at you and they would say, you don't have anything else to gain here from Rokas. You know, like you're, you're, too, you know, you're too good for us. It's like, you learned everything, just go, you know, we had enough of you. And I, th I thought I will, I will dedicate myself to such degree that, that that would happen, that I wouldn't have to ask, can I leave already open my dojo? That they would kind of kick me out and say, we had enough of you, you're ready to open your dojo. It's interesting, like, again, following the storyline that that's actually what happened. Uh, a year passed from that day and I passed my second degree black belt exam and everyone was really impressed. Uh, now that I look back at it, I'm like, oh, I could have been done better. But, but there are some moments where I did, I did, apparently I did a really good job. And everyone in the community where they were like, whoa, it was one of the best examples I ever saw and, and so on and so on. And everyone was like super, super impressed. And, uh, and I was doing a lot of work. Like I was, that's all I was living and breathing of and, and reading all the books and training extra, you know, with 15 classes per week, I was still doing extra training. And uh, again, a moment I remember very vividly is uh, the year was coming to an end, like the physical year, calendar year. And we were chilling during the Christmas vacation, the village was closed, and we were making our schedule for the next year. And uh, my Aikido instructor told me, said, well, you know what? I think, uh, Rokas, you're, you know, you should, uh, that, this and that date should, would be good for you to leave and open your dojo. I'm like, I'm freaking out. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't see that coming. It was really weird. I was so pumped all that time before to, to go out there and open my dojo. I could, I was so looking for it. I couldn't, I couldn't wait for it. And then I settled in to just kind of becoming a great student, being a great student. And the, when the day came and I didn't see it coming and he told me, you know, we should schedule when you, you're going to leave uh, the dojo to open your thing. And I was like, holy crap, is this real? Is this really happening? Are we really having that conversation? And I was freaking out. I was like, am I ready to leave? I'm, I started almost feeling anxious. And, uh, and I, 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 again, I was surprised because in the past I just wanted to, I was looking forward for that day so much to be told, go out there and open a dojo. And when, I was, when that day came, I, I, I was confused. I was almost uh, scared. But then I settled into it and I was like, you know what? Okay, that means I'm ready. And a while later, eventually, you know, I went to India for that month. I came back to Lithuania and there's an episode of how that went. But so it's, it's a very interesting kind of storyline of that whole process. But there's a lot of things that happened meanwhile. <laughs> so let's come back to that. Uh, so one of the things I mentioned was me going to personal meetings with my Aikido instructor. And uh, they were kind of like coaching, spiritual coaching, I guess. And uh, it was very specific and it was actually really intense too. It's something I do look back and I appreciate that. I think it wasn't always done in the best way, but I kind of appreciate that, that hard school, psychological school. Uh, it helped me grow a lot, but it's, 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 it's an interesting method. 
now that I look back. So the way it would happen, uh, if we come back even to these first three months, uh, the very first time I went to Switzerland to, to, to live in the school, uh, we would sit down for the coffee and uh, my kid instructor would ask what I want. And, and I told him I wanted to become my kid instructor. And I can't remember exactly what I said, but I guess the lines of, of the thought was like, I want to help people, I want to be you know, inspiring and so on. And then that never changed. And uh, he then would ask certain questions and give certain feedback. But most of the times when we would meet, he would be very specific in pointing out the differences between what you said and what you do or your, what you did. And it's kind of, again, an interesting methodology. Basically, the way it went, uh, so let's say I wanted to, I would say to him, I want to be more honest. And because we spend all so much time together, he would catch those moments when I wouldn't be honest, per se. Not, it's not like a specific example, but, but a general example. So he would caught, catch that and, and we would sit down for the coffee and he's like, well, do you remember you told me that you want to be more honest, but that day, at that moment, you did this and that. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> or whenever I, I would have like a naive thought, something he wouldn't agree about. And sometimes uh, to a correct degree, like I had kind of a faulty idea. He would break that down and he would point it out and she, he would show you your flaws really well. He's like, look, you're doing this wrong. You know, this part of you is you're saying this and you're saying and you're doing that. And uh, he would prove that some of the thoughts that you have or ideas are false through kind of rational, logical breaking down or just kind of not always. Sometimes it was, you know, his own perspective, but but still it was an interesting process because it, it always challenged, and I know it wasn't just for me, all of the, especially the long-termers, uh, which Adeshis who lived with in, in, in his school, we would all come back from those meetings half broken. Because he would push us to the, to the kind of furthest points of pointing out you your flaws and making you admit that you're wrong in some places. I think, you know, it wasn't like, egocentric from him it was it was it was really he was really trying to kind of you know in that specific way to, to help you out improve so the way i would describe it he would kind of break you down where you would realize oh my god i was wrong you know oh my god i i screwed up i i i didn't do what i said i wanted to do and usually by the end of the meeting there would be like a sense of panic or a sense of complete confusion and lot you're like I, I, I thought I knew you come into that meeting feeling like I know my stuff, I know my shit. And then at the end of the meeting, you're like, I don't know anything. And you come back, you're lost and confused. And again, I know that most of us experience that's the same. And for a couple of days, you're completely, you know, confused and you're thinking, so what's right, what's wrong, where am I feeling and so on. And then slowly you start to kind of build yourself up again. And you're reconstructing yourself and you're like, well, actually, no, you know, he's right here and I could improve here. And you know what? Actually, I think this is true. And by the end of the week, you would kind of feel like you're back on, on your feet and you meet again and the same exact thing happens. At some of those meetings, I almost cried. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a big crier. I don't cry often. But at some of those meetings, I all, it was like I was that close to crying. He pushed me to the furthest points. Interesting thing too is I told him to as well. That was his methodology, but also early enough when we met, I told him, you know what? I want to learn as fast as I can. I want to, to learn as much as I can. You hit me with everything. Don't spare me. Don't hold back on me. If there's some feedback you have for me, give it. You know, just like go full on. Don't, don't, don't hesitate on, on telling me about stuff because you think, you know, I won't take it. I'm like, I'm going to take it all. And sometimes he would push me where I was like breaking down, almost crying. And he's like, remember, August, you asked for it. You asked for this. I was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you follow that storyline specifically, uh, that, that was very evident the first year I lived there. The first, in the first year of our relationship. Uh, by the beginning of, in mid of, middle of second month, uh, second year, sorry. Um, that started to change. I started, it was harder. It, it became more and more difficult for him to catch my flaws. Not because I was hiding them, not at all actually, but just because, you know, I started to see what he's talking about and I would, I would be able to, you know, 
I would slip less and less in telling that I want to do something and not acting on it. My words and my actions became more and more con consistent. And uh, and also too, I mean, uh, again, I, I mentioned to you, I really want to, you know, present the positive side here, but I'll just slightly mention this part. You know, also too, I think it's important to, to kind of recognize that maybe also because I, I understood his perspective and I was able to relate with it. And I did it in a sincere way, but you know, I was able to know what he's expecting, to know what he believes in, and those became my beliefs as well. And so we clicked more, you know, I didn't challenge him, I didn't question him. And maybe, you know, that's when I, when I was saying that whatever he's saying is true because I believed it, he didn't challenge me so much. In the past, if I'd be like, well, what about this? You know, and he would prove me wrong in some way, then, you know, I would be in a crisis. So again, it's kind of a consideration. But then by the end of coming back to the story, by the end of second year uh, or second year, mid second year, I was like, I was barely challenged anymore. You know, we were on the same page. I was really, you know, playing my game at the top level and those challenges didn't come across anymore. So eventually that changed, but the first year, it was really intense. It was really tough, especially for me being, you know, an 18, 19 year old guy thinking I know everything and being proved I don't know nothing. But for those deconstructions and reconstructions, I feel that they empowered me in a way where I feel like, you know, that, that may, be more, may be more mature and ready to, to face big challenges and, and to know what I believe in and to know what I'm about. There's also the dark side, which I spoke about in other videos. Now, not that it was all perfect, but as I promised, I will focus on the good side here. Uh, looking at the whole experience one more time, just reflecting about the whole thing. Uh, one more challenge was, which I didn't see coming, was living in a community, living in a close uh, community. Like we were spending a lot of time together, the Luchideshis, uh, we barely had any personal space. We cooked for each other as well. And we were also all in that intense process where we were questioned all the time and, and we were questioning our beliefs and um, we were pushed to our edge. And so that kind of came across because we were pushed to the edge. We kind of ended up pushing each other to the edge. And this is a slight moment I'll mention, I, which is my personal belief. I mentioned in some other videos that I feel my, my kid instructor was using fear and kind of judgment to, to keep us in line. And we did that to each other, which I think was the worst part. You know, we were really judgmental of each other, not like on all levels, like, oh, you're, you're, you know, you suck at this, but, but especially in terms of like household things, you know, if somebody would fuck up some uh, chore that they had to do and we, that was part of our deal. We were cleaning the dojo and cooking for each other and et cetera, et cetera. So if somebody fucked up something, we were all like really heavy on it. I think I was the lightest. I, I didn't like that already, but still I, I was part of the game. So we we're all kind of punishing each other for our mistakes. And so it was like really, sometimes it was better, sometimes it was worse. But uh, eventually actually I became the senior student. I, I, I was the I was the senior uh, Uchideshi, so I was kind of setting up the vibe. And I think when I was the most senior one, I was setting up the vibe. I made it lighter and more friendly and so on. But beforehand, there was another person who was the senior Chideshi. And that person was very critical, quite judgmental. And, uh, and that was kind of the vibe that was set up. So it was even worse. So that was a lot. That was very intense. Though, though. Like, like constantly knowing that you're under the radar, you're under the magnifying glass. As soon as you're going to fuck up, everyone's going to tell you that. It was stressful. But also, uh, that made me learn to live in a community. To, to, we also were forced, and that was kind of part of the vibe, part of the culture there, to always uh, confront each other. If, if, you, if you don't like something and something is, you know, you think is unjust, you go and confront each other and you talk about it and you talk it out. And I don't think that that's the best way to go, but, but that was the, the hardcore school for me because I learned to deal with conflict all the time. We were like, so there were so many conflicts, so many times we had to talk to each other and, and face each other, that by the end, when I came back to Lithuania and I was so used to that, I appreciated that part because I went through hell uh, when my students would 
challenge me or, or we would have some discussion or there was some con conflict that I needed to address and confront, I had no problem. Till this day, I'm, I'm not that afraid to come in. Cut to If somebody wants to talk about with me about something heavy, I'm like, let's do this, man. I've done this so many times. I don't feel uncomfortable. So that's a superpower, I guess, that, that I gained from that living of hell to a degree. Yeah, and, uh, and I think just a couple more things. Uh, the, the, another really cool moment of the story, kind of unique, that I feel will be valuable for you to hear, is that the first time I came there, the first three months, and then again, the second time I came for a couple months, I was so inspired, I was so hyped that, um, that I was not, I was barely sleeping. I was reading books all the time and I was training. I would go out on the map because the map was always accessible and I would just do my solo practice like at 4 a.m. or something. I was super inspired and that was kind of crazy. And I did a lot of experiments. Like I was like, what if I don't sleep at all? Or what if I eat only when I'm offered to eat? Or stuff like that. So I, I got a lot of explorations and that was wild, but I, you know, I also learned a lot. But another interesting part of the story is that after those three months of spending there, the time initially, when I came back to Lithuania, actually I lost most of my friends, which is interesting now to look back, because I was so changed, you know, I, I, and I felt like I was changed. I did change, but also I felt, I feel like I felt that I changed. I believed in that change so much, and I was so hyped about what was being taught there that my friends have a difficult time to connect with me anymore. They're like, who's this guy? They loved me as, as joke as before, but I came back, you know, with all these new ideas and inspirations and some of my friends stayed, but some of them were like, well, okay, he's too weird for us. And there's good and bad in that. I think at that time I was more focusing on blaming them. They're like, oh, you know, I'm just on a different level and they don't understand me. Now that I look back, maybe, you know, maybe I was a bit too, you know, cultish too um, hyped about the whole thing and, and later I toned down and I could relate to them more. Maybe I pushed things too far at that day, but it was an interesting experience that, that, that some of them couldn't take my changes and, and kind of I lost friends because of that. I guess it's worth a whole different ex exploration, but I try to, when I talk in those videos, the lesson that I learned the hard way, I really want to give you the, the best of the best of my discoveries. I don't want to think out loud too much on record so maybe it's something I'll think about more next time and talk about in a different video so yeah wrapping things up there were a lot of different things that happened there I'll actually let's drink a coffee yeah there were really a lot of things that happened here a lot of there are a lot of experiences I really felt like I matured I learned so much but also to you there's a lot of things I didn't learn and that's evident in some of the other stories I already told you and will tell you no, uh, I didn't really learn so much about life. The school was so spiritual that I was kind of an adept, adept and good at understanding that spiritual realm. You know, being in the flow, being one with the universe and, and kind of using your intuition and trusting life. That was a big subject, big top topic. You know, that life is intelligent and it guides you where you need to be. And I kind of believe a little bit of that still. Of course, I'm more skeptical about that, but, but I was like all about that. And I think that's what also made me made me exciting to my Aikido students when I came back to Lithuania and opened my dojo. They were all like, holy crap, who's this, you know, some spiritual being here. So, uh, but, but there were also a lot of things I did learn and, and some of the realities weren't really addressed. So, you know, there were pros and cons. But, but yeah, as I said, I really wanted to share with you the positive side of the story. And I hope you got some interesting, cool bits and uh, pieces from it. If you're interested about some other aspect of that whole experience, uh, let me know. Often, actually, very often, I still, I usually try to make these about 30 minutes long at most. So, so I think I still have a few minutes to, to tap touch that. A lot of people ask me about money. It's like, how did you support yourself? So maybe I'll just right away answer it here. So the thing is, um, I have to say a huge thank you to my parents. They, they, they were supporting me financially, although it was tough for them. But they were helping me out and I'm grateful for that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, but it wasn't, I wasn't putting it all on their shoulders. Uh, I did work my ass off while I was, after those three months, when I came back to Lithuania initially, 
um, before I went back to Switzerland, I worked like I worked in my dad's company. I was digging actually <laughs> this uh, this house that stands there. Uh, my dad built it. So at that house, I was I was digging holes there before it was built, and I was also at the same place. I was also being a security guard, just walking around, ensuring that someone is there. Uh, but the money was still low, and our economy in Lithuania was way lower than Switzerland's. So the money I earned through a few months of hard work, you know, it, it lasted to me in, in Switzerland, it lasted me like a month or two months. The economy is just so higher, so much higher there, so much more expensive. Yeah, so I was always, I was always saving money. I was all, I was never a big spender. And then I was really buying the, the cheapest things and really making sure I don't spend much money outside. Like going to restaurants or something was not, I could not do that by no means like if I bought a kebab once in a month for company with others it was like wow the kebab was just like so expensive for me <laughs> so I bought only the cheapest of the cheapest things and uh, yeah so I learned my ways around that and also to uh, people some people are generous around that area so in the, the bigger community of that school some people would give me some uh, chores for them to do and they would pay me money like Oh, you know, I need someone to set up my phone. Can you come in and, you know, set it up for me or walk my dog? I was walking a dog of my friend uh, in Switzerland and he was paying me money for that, um, which is pretty good money because, you know, it was Swiss standards. And uh, my keto instructor, I have to be grateful for him as well because sometimes he would give us some work like in the dojo to build something or at his house to build something and he would pay us money for that. And he knew I needed money. So, so he was more generous in those options. So I, I do appreciate that. And also, but, but the first year was harder because, you know, I was still just building my way up. Uh, but when I got my black belt, it started to become easier uh, because first of all, uh, my instructor gave me the option to teach private classes, which I wasn't that bad at. And people would take those private classes often enough with me and I got some extra money. Uh, he also gave me the job, uh, offered me the job of cleaning his house which he gave me some money for, which again, I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I was actually cleaning his house for about like almost two years. It was like a free story, three, four building. So it was a lot of cleaning, but, but still I can't complain. You know, I got some money for that. And also too, I eventually, he gave me the senior position of the, you know, when I became the senior Chideshi, uh, he also gave me some discounts and this and that. Uh, for with the deal that you know I will be supervising the Uchideshis and you know I will be taking more responsibilities, teaching some Aikido classes for him if he wasn't around. So so yeah, I I, I kind of was looking for options myself. Sometimes people would offer me stuff. My parents were always supporting me, but the further I went into it, the less I needed support from them because I I didn't I never wanted to be supported mainly by them. I wanted to make sure that you know I don't abuse <laughs> their finances. Uh, but yeah, and as far as, you know, we have some hard mis misunderstandings or hard, hard disagreements with my former kid instructor, as I said, I am grateful for some of the things he did. And that's one of them, you know, he, he definitely uh, tried to make the program accessible to me and gave me options and so on. So, but that's kind of how I f financed and supported myself uh, there. But yeah, aside from that, if you have any questions about some details, let me know and you know, maybe I'll just make another episode in the future about that. But I think there, th these are some main uh, fun parts of that story. I'm sure I'm missing some, there's so much, but at least you kind of have an overview and a feeling of what it was and how it went. So, so if you have more questions, let me know. Thank you for staying with me for these whole two episodes. I hope they were valuable and you learned something good from it. And as always, keep questioning, and I'll see you in the next one. Actually, you know what? I just realized I was kind of sitting here looking back at the footage that I already recorded, and I realized there's one more important, valuable thing I wanted to share with you all uh, that I kind of introduced but never summed it up as a valuable message. Uh, I guess I spoke about that a little bit in uh, one of the previous episodes of opening my own Aikido Dojo, and I slightly pointed to that but I feel that story and that particular part, you know, where I was completely devoted, I was, I was like, uh, like madly um, always learning and picking everything up and being more attentive, asking more questions and training more than anyone else. 
I think that was part of the reason I was able to open my successful school, my own school. And obviously, you know, there were there were other elements, my passion, my enthusiasm, and so on. But but that also gave me confidence because it's something I keep reminding myself. And in general, you know, people talk about the importance of niche expertise. I agree, they're super important. And they were super important, especially back then to me as a young person and trying to establish myself in this world and provide value. Uh, but the fact that I was so madly devoted to learning, I was reading more than anyone else. I was uh, you know, doing all those that, that extra training and putting all that extra attention and effort. I think that did lead me to kind of go further at the game than most people around me or even though I was young and that was a big challenge for me. I was a young guy wanting to do something which usually older people do, meaning Aikido instructor. And I knew that I need to come, somehow step up the game to balance out the scales. So, um, so that really helped because by being so devoted to learning, to, to being a great student, I, I learned more things than usually I, I was technically capable of knowing in that age. Uh, and that's kind of something I wanted to reflect with you quickly about is I feel it's an important lesson, especially, I guess, with millenniums these days. And it's something I bumped into uh, while I was running my own dojo. I had some volunteers, millenn millennium, you know, that, that age, uh, guys who, or and, and girls who were in crisis. And I realized the articles that I read, they were true. Uh, the article said, I, I through direct conversations with them, I learned that whatever the article said turned out to be true, especially in those cases, and I'm sure there's more, is because those guys that I met and ladies, they were born into having all of these things already, you know, laptops, internet, and so on, and, and they're surrounded by the stardom of YouTube and Instagram, and they come to a conclusion that kind of, you know, they're special already just because they're born, which is, you know, not really the way the world works. But they have that idea that, you know, as soon as they'll go out in the world, they're going to create something amazing. But the thing is, until you put in the grind, until you put in the work, until you dig deeper than anyone else, it will be difficult for you to create anything exceptional, anything valuable. And so I'm very happy I did that myself. And that's something I would recommend to anyone who wants to open their dojo, who wants to create something amazing, is first you need to do a lot of grinding. You need to do a lot of work. You need to choose a direction and go wild in it. And again, I'm happy I did that. And that tremendously helped me when I opened my dojo. Obviously, there were so many lessons I still didn't know. There were so many things I still wasn't aware of. And I had to learn for the hard way, through direct experience. Some of them just couldn't be taught by anyone else. You have to go through these things. But the, but the baggage of knowledge and experience I already had definitely made my path. Uh, easier for me and and that's again a, a moment where I appreciate that my Aikido instructor didn't let me go off the hook too easy and didn't let me go to open my Aikido school too early because then probably I would have burned out and uh, in an early stage and I wouldn't have handled it and I wouldn't have given enough to my students and the thing would have fell apart at early stages but the fact that I went there with such confidence and knowledge where I could easily sit down with another Aikido instructor who's like you know 30, 40 years old and, and has been in the game forever, but I could sit down with him and discuss about stuff and, and provide value even to him to a degree and prove that I'm good at what I do because of all the hard work that I put in. So as the last message for this episode, that, that's something I wanted to make sure I do say, and it's a recurring subject I'll probably keep on coming back in various videos, is put in a lot of work. Don't, don't, you know, don't rush into giving and that's something I need to sometimes remind even myself, but don't rush into giving. First of all, make sure you get, and that's one of the reasons why I'm, I, I, I'm all about reading books again, and I want to also excel in my knowledge before I give even more to people. So, so it's, it's kind of a balance of learning and not hesitating to give. So yeah, quick reflection. I think it's a valuable one, so keep questioning.